I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ann Maitland. Ann Maitland, MD, PhD, is an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York of the Allergy and Clinical Immunology Division, as well as the Medical Director of Comprehensive Allergy and Asthma Care in Westchester, New York. Considered one of the thought leaders on the emerging field of mast cell disorders, Dr. Maitland currently serves on the medical scientific advisory boards of the Ellers Danlos Society, the Mastocytosis Society, and the Bobby Jones Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation. She's the former past chair for the Committee for the Underserved and current vice chair, chairperson for the Mast Cell Disorders Committee of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and is a member of the Allergy Immunology Faculty of the National Medical Association. Dr. Maitland has also partnered with Dr. Okay, Zhu Min Xu Lei. Dr. Lee, Shuman Lee. Okay, Shuman Lee, a prominent, thank you, a prominent expert in complementary medicine with a focus on the use of traditional Chinese herbal medicine and acupuncture in the management of hypersensitivity disorders such as allergic skin disorders, asthma, and food allergy. She's the author or co-author of numerous papers and scientific reports with clinical interests in diagnosis and management of immune-mediated disorders, <laughs> as well as meeting the unmet need of children and adults whose lives are impacted by chronic inflammation, pain syndromes, as well as neurocognitive impairment. <laughs> and she is just an amazing, awesome person. You know what my brother said? He's like, are you planning on getting a real job soon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Raven. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, and I'm thrilled to see everyone here. Um, I have to tell you that um, one of my first lessons uh, in medical school was a rheumatologist who said, each and every one of you need to be on the other side of the bedpan at least once, and some of you SOBs twice. <laughs> and I'm like, there are SOBs in this class? <laughs> but, but, but that being said, um, you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm not only uh, the president of the Air Club, but um, I've had cold-induced urticaria that morphed into um, every type of inflammatory, you know, any type of physical trigger possible. And that, and it just, it makes me think about all of what you have to do just to, you know, move each day. And I think a lot of doctors who are just completely overwhelmed by the systems that they work in do, either don't have the wherewithal or the willingness to listen. And so, I, if anything, I would really encourage you, you need to empower yourselves. And you need to know how to ask the questions and identify a practitioner who is willing and able to work with you, okay? Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about mast cells, just a little bit. <laughs> I'm a T cell biologist by training, and I have to tell you, I didn't know, know about mast cells at Yale, at University of Pennsylvania, or at Brigham which is a Harvard-affiliated program. And what's sad about that is mast cells were actually identified in the mid-1800s. And they lit up beautifully uh, in Germany uh, with Paul Ehrlich because he borrowed the uh, rich dyes that they used for the Burgermeister's clothing, and he threw it onto living tissue. And in every single organ system, these mast cells lit up. And so they, and he named them Matt Zellin, because it kind of reminds them, I guess, of the Burgermeister, because they were fat cells. Um, but as it turns out, their job is not to take, but to, also, but to serve and protect the tissue that they've been assigned to. So we're going to have a little conversation. I'm happy, to, I really do treat this as a conversation. So if you have any questions or already? Wow. No. <laughs> OK, perfect. So uh, a couple of disclosures. I, I am on the Speakers Bureau for two companies, um, Sanofi uh, and uh, uh, Genetech. And <clears throat> these young girls, actually the leader of this group, raised money so that I could do a little research project, which I'll talk about. Um, so it really does take a village in order to try to help each other. 
So this is what I was taught uh, back in 1989. And uh, this was, by, by the way, this was just after HIV was recognized by the White House. Um, and that kind of dominated the picture where we really focused on T cells and B cells and not on the innate immune system. And the thing about these cells is they really just sit in the tissue. You can't see them in the blood. And so the urine test and the blood test is really just indirect evidence that these cells are misbehaving. And so if you really want to know if these mis cells are misbehaving, you really need to kind of go into the tissue where you're having problems. But it's, you know, they were identified pretty early. Um, really no one knew what they did for a long, long time. Um, and it wasn't until 1988 uh, at the National Institutes of Health, uh, Ron Paul and a few others identified uh, IgE. Um, and IgE is that antibody that gets tested when you have the skin testing or when you have the blood tests. Um, and ever since that was identified, the focus really has been if you have a hypersensitivity reaction, we're just going to test you for that one single antibody. But these cells are found in C squirts that don't have T cells and B cells. So clearly, they have the ability to see the environment other than that one single receptor. And I think that's the problem, is just how we've been trained. So in many ways, this is the miseducation of Ann Maitland, that I had to kind of learn how to listen to your stories, and then figure out how we can figure out if your mast cells are misbehaving. And, on the, and, and to be honest, if you can't figure out if you can't figure out why your mast cells are misbehaving, just restraining them um, with antihistamines and catodafin and chromalin um, really is kind of you know, putting a muzzle and a, a, a leash on a dog that's been trained to recognize danger. So this is essentially what I was taught. You have, uh, you have T cells and B cells that became sensitized and we're still trying to figure out that process for the most part. IgE sits on mast cells and basophils uh, as well as antigen presenting cells. And then once you see that object that you became sensitized uh, to before, you will then start kicking out chemicals like histamine and prostaglandins. But understand these cells are not one trick ponies. And this is probably what has led to such a delayed uh, appreciation of how mast cells can contribute to so many different uh, syndromes uh, in individuals. And it really is location, location, location. Anyone been in New York? You know, so if you go like two blocks, one minute you're in Chinatown, the next you're in Little Italy, that's what your body is like. You know, so these cells are born in the bone marrow, right? And uh, what they do is they get their initial training, uh, kind of like a man or woman who, who, who graciously joins the police force, um, gets their training, and then they get assigned different communities. So if you can imagine someone who's assigned you know, Times Square and someone who's assigned right down the street, they have to learn to meet the needs of that community. They have to learn that community. And that's what happens. These cells get shipped to your brain, get shipped to different parts of your skin, and your gut, and your kidneys. And it's that environment that teaches the mast cell what its job is supposed to do. But what happened along the way after HIV came under control, um, the other epidemic that struck New York started to rear its ugly head. And we started seeing primarily children, um, starting with eczema and food allergies and rhinitis and asthma. And all of these conditions, there are allergic and non-allergic triggers. Um, and then the consequences are of, of becoming sensitized, and, and I'll talk a little bit about why that happens. We now, the latest studies show that one out of 50 um, have had a anaphylactic event in this country, right? And unfortunately, there's only two of us in the room who've been trained on how to do allergy immunology. Um, and that's a shame, because in this country, there's only 77 training programs, which means there are states that don't have training programs, which means there are nurses and doctors who've never had any exposure besides their textbook on what mast cells do. So this is a quote from uh, Science Magazine 2007 because they started to realize that maybe mast cells do a little bit more than just contribute to allergic reactions. And they start off this, this, this comment by saying mast cells are the most reviled cells in the body. 
Um, you know, they make you itch, they can cause asthma exacerbations, they can even cause anaphylaxis. Um, to the point that some doctors try to figure out, or scientists try to figure out how we can eliminate mast cells. And that would be a really big mistake. Because these cells really are responsible for a lot of other things besides um, causing allergic reactions. And understand, allergic reactions only became an epidemic in the 21st century. Okay, were there episodes much, much earlier? Yes. Um, but much more isolated. It is now an epidemic. So, as I said, the mast cells are born in the bone marrow. They get their initial training and then they, they migrate. Uh, and then we really don't know how heterogeneous this, patient, this mast cell population is because they'll upregulate or downregulate receptors as well as all those fun chemicals. Let's see if I can do this right. Yeah. So, all these sacs have different chemical mediators in them. So some have chymase, some have, most of them have tryptase, they can have platelet activating factor, tumor necrosis factor, um, and by the way, there's two different ways that mast cells can misbehave. So um, uh, uh, Steve Galley uh, in California showed that some mast cells will just explode. Uh, others will migrate to lymph nodes and then explode. It's kind of like fireworks. You ever see ones that just really blow up and then they go up in the air and then blow up even more? So mast cells actually have the ability to influence the immune response not only locally but also regionally as well. And so they're born in the bone marrow. We really can't identify them besides uh, a, in a, uh, mostly in an immature state uh, circulating in the blood. <clears throat> but Honestly, the best way to identify them is to stain them. And if you don't use the right stains, you won't see them. So they're kind of like ninjas unless you light them up. Um, and so you have to use stains that focus on, uh, so classic H and E stain, which is what they do when they do the endoscopies, which help identify E cinephils, you won't see mast cells. So you have to tell the pathologist, please use a stain that recognizes mast cells um, or enzymes that are found, particularly in the mast cells as well. And so, just to give you an example, we had a young lady, similar to um, what we heard regarding your daughter as well. Um, everybody had food poisoning at the university dining hall. <laughs> um, she's the only one who stayed sick. And so she got scoped uh, up in New Hampshire, and then she got scoped again when she went to New York City, and she got scoped again in, um, in Westchester. And so the nice thing about when they do endoscopies, they usually keep pieces and freeze them down. And so we went back to each one of those um, uh, endoscopies and saw that she had more than 55 mast cells per high power field. So that's, so that's one way you can identify somebody who has a mast cell disorder. And again, that just says that your mast cells are misbehaving. It's not telling you why. And you can see lots of different receptors. So you have the Ig receptor, which actually had a job to do when our families were living by the riverbed and you had to worry about trypanosomiasis. This was your way. These are all sensors to try to figure out what is going on in the surrounding neighborhood or environment. So you have IgG receptors, you have complement receptors, toll receptors. And the toll receptors, or toll-like receptors, were originally identified in fruit flies. So even fruit flies need to defend themselves. Right? And so on human cells, we have all these different toll receptors that can recognize various pathogens and chemicals. And understand, you can have these cells react to manufactured or naturally occurring substances. But these cells are really can be like a hand grenade. God bless. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> really can be like a hand grenade. So you, you don't want these guys going off willy-nilly. And there are checks and balances in this system that get overwhelmed in the, in the world that we live in today. So it really is kind of the question about usual suspects, right? So, so these are all pathogens that have been problematic for your family's generations. And unfortunately, the world really changed on a Thanos snap in the late 1990s, okay? So I grew up in the Bronx, which is now ground zero for a lot of hypersensitivity disorders. But, you know, here's the thing. We had milk delivered in glass bottles, right? Uh, the butcher cut the meat and put it into paper. 
it wasn't shipped from Brazil or North Dakota or whatever. <laughs> um, if it was cold, you turned on the heat. If it was hot, you opened up the windows. Um, and you know, classic New Yorker. Um, after high school, after school, you did your chores, right? You played outside, and then you stayed outside until it got dark. We now spend 90% of our time indoors, with everything from whatever is coming off the the carpeting to whatever has been painting, to whatever was in the ventilation systems. And then you talk about personal products, you know, people wearing perfumes or colognes or what have you. So all of these are chemicals that your body has to try to figure out is safe or not safe. And what we have found is there seems to be individuals that are susceptible to attack, and that such as getting antibiotics for an infection that was not being able to clear. So that's like the danger signal that just never went away. And so now your mast cells won't stand down because they think they're seeing a dangerous situation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that mast cells are kind of like, dare I say, border life. <laughs> um, so really the purpose of the mast cells is they're, they're purposely situated right below the surface area near your blood vessels and near your nerves because unlike most most medical specialists the nerves talk to the mast cells the mast cells talk to the blood vessels everybody's talking within the tissue to figure out what they need to do to, for the next steps and individuals that have a connective tissue issue we're still trying to figure out is is it the connective tissue issue that caused the mast cell dysfunction or is it the mast cell dysfunction that caused the connective tissue issue? And I think the nerves act as collateral damage in the process. So this is the internal check. So these mast cells are sitting in the tissue and they're, they're secreting things because their job is to like make sure there's no chemicals that are awry, make sure that there's no tissue damage because they kind of help coordinate the cleanup. But then if there's something that causes the danger signal, an infection, penetrating trauma, a, a physical burn, something causes leakage within the cells to leak out their products to say, okay, now we have tissue damage. Now the mast cells will uptick their activity and then use those sensors to try to figure out what is causing the damage. And they have hardwired pathways to respond to whatever they think they're seeing. So if it is an engagement through the IgE receptor, they think it's a parasite, and then they'll kick out histamine and tryptase. But if they go through the toll receptors, interestingly enough, they don't kick out histamine and tryptase. They, they'll kick out tumor necrosis factor, they'll kick out some cytokines. And so there's a differential pathway depending on what the mast cell sees when the body is stressed. And as you can see, lots of different types of receptors. And also estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, cortisol releasing factors. Their job is to participate in homeostasis. Make sure that you're staying within, it's kind of like when you're driving on the highway, you can't go less than 45 because the people behind you are not gonna be very happy. You can't go more than 65 because the police are not gonna be very happy with you. Um, so the job of the mast cell is to talk to the nerves, sorry, to talk to the nerves in the tissue to make sure everything is at peace, homeostatic, the baseline. And what we find is if you continue to get insults, the system will, will uptick its activity. And now you have a fixed amount of nutrition, you have a fixed amount of oxygen running around, and you now need to make a decision. Are you gonna participate in a fight? That's the wrong type of fight? Or are you, gonna, or are you going to rebuild your tissue? Are you gonna participate in maintenance, right? And so what we find is that people, as they become more um, symptomatic, with mast cell and nerve and connective tissue issues, you have less and less resources. And then that adds to the stress. So you, uh, unfortunately, you're passing forward. And so when it comes to kind of treating individuals that have um, mast cell dysfunction, um, it's really important to understand what the stressors are. Because if you don't reduce the stress, then the danger signal never goes away. And the danger signal never goes away. The mast cells will not stand down. 
And by taking medications like ketodafin goes after, is a mast cell stabilizer, chromalin is a mast cell stabilizer. There's some situations that histamine is not released, so the Zantac and the Zyrtec is not going to work, right? And that's probably why your daughter's having breakthrough. If you really want to know how potent mast cells are, you should YouTube honey badgers. <laughs> and if anybody knows what a honey badger is, these guys, I mean, they're bad little suckers there. <laughs> so um, the video that Steve Galley showed us was this honey badger went up with, against this poisonous African snake, went up to the snake, took the mouse out of its mouth, ate it then went back and attacked the snake and started defanging it. Caught it, defanged it. And I'm like, and then all of a sudden, they're like, uh-oh. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> the fang caught him in the inside of his mouth. Next thing you know, he's on his back. I'm like, ah, oh, he's a goner. 20 minutes later, he's up. Triptase has the ability to break down venom. So nature is not wasteful. Triptase has a job, histamine has a job, heparin has a job, chymase has a job, right? It's just these tools are being used inappropriately in the world that we live in right now. So this is, this is more reflective, ladies, of women's work when the honey badger out and out. And, 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 but now we live in an environment where there's a new chemical uh, being introduced into the food that you eat the cosmetics that you apply to your skin, the ventilation systems, is completely overwhelming your body's ability to clear. Um, so for instance, uh, Johnson & Johnson, they were slick. Sorry if anybody works for Johnson & Johnson. <laughs> they just announced that they were taking out 50% of the ingredients in baby shampoo, 50%. Gone is you know, 99 and 44 hundredths. And you go, and you go down the, the, the supermarkets and, and Walgreens that I perused before coming here, there's so many, if you, you turn the bottle around, there's so many chemicals in there in order for that stuff to sit on the shelf. And here's the thing, in the 1970s is when the FDA approved for preservatives to be added to food, including baby food. And so... And, and same thing for medications. There's a reason why somebody who can be a pharmacy tech working at Walgreens or CVS is because they, they just take pills that are sitting in a jar and then put it in a bottle with your name on it and it has an expiration date for a long, long time. So there's a reason why compounding is, is helpful because you minimize the preservatives, the colorings, the excipients. So, so mast cell disorders were, were originally uh, surmised back in, uh, easily about 20 years ago. And it was interesting, it was like two trains running. So you had the individuals, hematologists, oncologists, as well as allergy immunology specialists taking care of patients who have, mass cell, have mastocytosis. That's probably the more well-recognized clonal mast cell disorder. Um, and so most, most doctors either know about mastocytosis or allergies. And another way to say allergies is allergen-driven mast cell activation. Okay? But then they started seeing individuals that were having reactivity and there was no evidence of mastocytosis and there was no allergen uh, demonstra demonstrated by either skin testing or immunocap testing. And so they figured, okay, instead of just talking about allergic or non-allergic, why don't we talk about different ways that mast cells activate. And more importantly, why don't we just see if we can capture these individuals by saying, do you have signs or symptoms worrisome for mast cells misbehaving in at least two organ systems? Okay? Do you respond to medications? Do you feel better by taking medications like histamine blockers? And then show me the data. But here's the thing, that was like 25 years ago. This article just came out this past May. So on average, a newly recognized condition, according to New England Journal of Medicine, will take 17 years before it works its way into the general medical community. So this is kind of the uphill battle that you're fighting in that there's just lack of education. And for some places, it's not even lack of education, it's just downright resistance. 
So I'm borrowing this from, from the multiple chemical sen sensitivity folks, but it's, it's apropos. What, you, you have individuals that are sensitive, they get exposed to chemicals, whether you ingest it, <coughs> God bless, whether you ingest it or you breathe it in or it goes through your skin and it sensitizes you. And these are all the wonderful chemicals that can be found in your home from carbon monoxide to formaldehyde. Matter of fact, liquid lumber, uh, lumber liquidators um, had to recall uh, hardwood from China because off-gassing formaldehyde caused people to develop asthma for the first time. So all this pollution then allows for more re-exposures and then you become symptomatic. And as you can see, this really is a new epidemic because Really, this is when we started seeing a rise in hypersensitivity disorders. And understand, there are four types of hypersensitivity disorders. Type one is you have allergies or you're going through that FC receptor. Type two is you've actually developed antibodies and decided to go after something in you, like your platelets or your red blood cells. Type three, um, you've decided to make an antibody to attack something in your body and then your, your other part of the immune system comes and starts killing that organ. And type 4 is more cell mediated. So a more common form, some forms of asthma, allergic contact dermatitis, more severe forms for the healthcare providers would be something like Stevens-Johnson. Okay, so and guess what? All of those in some way may be going through the mast cell depending on what receptors are being engaged or not. And who is at risk? So uh, in 2012, um, I met a little boy who kind of was my matrix take the blue pill moment. And um, I was allergist number 11. Uh, and he was, again, anaphylaxis, food intolerance. He was down to six foods, asthma, flushing. And he was just really long and lanky and, his, and was sitting in a W at like four years old. And mom looked long and lanky. And this was like my introduction to connective tissue disorders past my one board question like 10 years before. <clears throat> so I'm going to just quickly go through the mast cell diagnosis. There's lots of different chemicals that mast cells can kick out. But it really boils down to do you have one of these syndromes, right? Do you get better with medications that target the mast cells? Um, and what data do you have to support that your mast cells are misbehaving? So to give you an idea about the signs and symptoms uh, on the, that one, <laughs> sorry. So this is from individuals that have mastocytosis and this is what will cause people to go see the doctor. So you have individuals that have skin lesions or itching and then it's GI distress, but right after that it's neuropsychiatric. And then you look at, um, God forbid, two different specialties get together. And this is what happened with um, uh, Matthew Hamilton. He joined forces with the Allergy and Allergy Division at Brigham and Women's and went into the IBS clinic. And he basically asked questions outside of the GI tract, like, do you have rhinitis, asthma? Have you ever been treated for anaphylaxis? And he identified 20 people very quickly. And these are individuals that have been on Linzess or, or whatever IBS drugs, because I'm not a gastroenterologist, and basically what they did was they switched them over to H1 and H2 blockade and 75% of them for the first time in like five to seven years felt better. Then they looked for data. Um, basically they had individuals that had hyperalpha tryptocemia, they had individuals that had elevated prostaglandin levels or elevated histamine levels or an elevated tryptase. And I'll talk about the tryptase in a minute, but I have to tell you there's only two specific tests for mast cell activation syndrome. That is a tryptase because histamine and prostaglandins are made by other cells. So having an elevated histamine level in the blood or 24-hour urine collection, if you can get the lab technician to keep it cold, um, although um, Mayo has just developed a spot test to do 24, to look at prostaglandins, uh, which would be really helpful. But either way, you're having a hypersensitivity disorder. Um, but what I really want you to take away from this is you pick an organ system and it can be problematic. And so if you look at my questionnaire from my website, it's 20 pages 
because I really need you to think about your story is a lot more informative than me doing testing. Okay, and so I asked you, do you, have you ever been treated for, aller for allergies with allergy shots? Have you ever been screened for asthma? And by the way, in this country, we don't know how many people have asthma because we don't screen for asthma. We wait for you to have an attack and say, by the way, you have asthma. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people come through my practice and I do a breathing test and they say, I'm fine. I'm like, uh, you're at 75% of predicted. <laughs> and so then I nebulize them with leave albuterol and chromalin. And by the way, chromalin is available as a lung preparation as well. And it's, it's amazing. They're breathing much more easily. Their neurocognitive impairment improves. So it's important to kind of identify, are you having an allergic-like headache disorder? Are you having IBS symptoms? Are you having interstitial cystitis? All of these things could be reflective of you having mast cells misbehaving in that part of your body, that neighborhood. Okay, going to the data. Again, serum tryptase. I have to tell you, we do not know what a normal tryptase level is. Don't. So, it's kind of like, you know, if you had chest pain and they only take one single blood test to figure out whether or not you're having a heart attack, right? If you want to figure out you're having a mast cell attack, attack get a baseline, and then you should have a lab slip from your doctor checking for your tryptase level after you've had an exacerbation because you have to check it within a few hours of the onset of symptoms. And if it goes up 2 plus 20%, that is diagnostic for mast cell activation syndrome. Also, data that has come out of the National Institutes of Health says if you have a serum tryptase of 6 or higher, you're at risk for having a duplication or triplication of the mast cell gene called the alpha tryptase. And that is also associated, interestingly enough, with mast cell activation syndrome, hypermobile type Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and dysautonomia. Sound familiar? Again, so who's zooming who? And, and what's really interesting is the geneticists have been working really hard to try to identify what is the gene in individuals that have hypermobile type Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually had the pleasure of meeting Claire Francovano a few years ago, and I said, I, and I, I, it was because um, the Russians actually had a test, they did a paper in 2011 describing uh, the peculiarities of mast cells in individuals that have connective tissue dysplasia. And interestingly enough, it came out of Siberia, so I don't, but the fact that it came out of Siberia, I'm like, why are the Siberians asking this question? What changed? Because I know they weren't using genetically modified foods. I think it was temperature. Now you're having heat piped in, right? So, so we're, we're, we're creatures of comfort, right? We will turn up the air conditioning or turn on the heat as opposed to training our bodies to get used to the environment that we're in. And so I think that has caused us to also contribute to having this upsurge in hypermobility issues as well. But interestingly enough, in those individuals in that Siberian paper, tryptase didn't look, was not unremarkable. Chymase was. So this is another area of research to try to understand. And chymase can clip collagen just like tryptase. Matter of fact, Thea, uh, Dr. Thea Herides, who's done mast cell research for about 20 years, calls tryptase the, the uh, meat tenderizer. So you have tryptase running around inappropriately. It's clipping collagen. How well do you respond to medications? So you have leukotriene antagonists. We have three different types out there, mast cell stabilizers such as chromalin. Traditional Chinese herbal therapy has been a little bit controversial in patients with, with such uh, um, comorbid disorders, but acupuncture, acupressure seems to be quite helpful. Um, tricyclic agents, and so this is an interesting story in the psychiatric world. So um, tricyclic agents were, were like the mainstay for mood disorders, um, and then uh, out came the SSRIs and SNRIs. So who picked it up? The psychiatrist dropped it, but who picked it up? So allergy immunology specialists use it for urticaria. Gastroenterologists use it for IBS. Neurologists use it for pain syndromes. Which one? Tricyclic agents. Yep. 
So, so it's not unusual for, for me to use medications like amitriptyline, nortriptyline, or doxepin. And matter of fact, doxepin is actually on the list for treating recalcitrant urticaria or hives. Steroids knock out lots of different cells, so that's not as specific. All right, so once you, once you secure the diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome, you need to figure out what flavor this is. And there's two different types. Either there's something broken within the cells, and that is rare probably less than 200,000 cases worldwide. More than likely, something is telling the mast cells to break bad. You have an immunodeficiency that's not recognized. You have a connective tissue disorder that hasn't been diagnosed. Um, you have an infection. And I, I'm, I'm not a big fan, Jen, I'll tell you right now, full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of Lyme and uh, Epstein-Barr um, testing. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation with the labs that do this, and I said, tell me, riddle me this. Can you tell the difference between exposure versus infection with these labs? And they said no. So how can you justify six months of IV antibiotics if you can't tell me this is not an infection? So you need to be really careful when you start using antibiotics because that's just going to wipe out your good bacteria. And and when you knock out your biome, guess what your mast cells are going to do? So this is the testing that I typically do, um, or if it has not been done before. Um, so yes, I make sure the allergy testing, and I especially look at perennial allergens like mold and dust mites. We go back and look at endoscopies and colonoscopies. We look at classic autoimmune disorders. Um, and by the way, there's lots of people running around with an ANA that just tells me you've had some tissue damage. It doesn't necessarily mean you're symptomatic. As a matter of fact, if I test IgE to peanut in this room, I probably have about four or five of you have IgE to peanut. But probably only one of you actually has problems with peanut. Well, I don't know. This group might be a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, um, in, out of the 600 patients that we have evaluated over the past six or seven years, we have identified a lot of immunodeficiencies. We have actually identified 15 patients that have idiopathic CD4 and lymphocytopenia. Looks like they have HIV and they don't. Uh, plenty of antibody deficiencies, um, also um, complement deficiencies as well. And so basically, in some ways, your mast cells are trying to compensate for something deficient elsewhere. Uh, and then we do screens. Uh, um, I, we presented at the American College of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology uh, a few years ago, and two of the thought leaders there said, are you telling me you want me to start bending people in, 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 in the office? I'm like, yes, I am. And I use myself as a comparison because a lot of people who are hypermobile don't know they're hypermobile, and I'm as stiff as a board. Right? But interesting, and, and, and seriously, if you try to pull my ear, it does not move. And people are like, oh! So this kind of gives you an idea about how lax your connective tissue is. So I also urge you to not hang your hat just on the mast cell diagnosis, because there are a lot of individuals who are running around with other hidden disorders that routinely get missed, such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, so, or Chiari syringomelia, or a immune-mediated neuropathy. You know, so it's really important to try to figure out, is there anything else going on that might be causing your mast cells to jump in the fray because that's their job. Their job is to surveil do surveillance, respond to any dangers it perceives, and then after the harm has been cleared, they're supposed to help coordinate tissue repair. So these are just some of the some of the things some of the conditions that are known to be uh, mimic mast cell activation syndrome. So I'm just going to share some of the thoughts. This is uh, my old office. Uh, it gets kind of frenetic, so it's kind of nice looking out the window. Like <sighs> another day, we made it. Um, but we have an ENT in my office, we have a dermatologist in my office, um, we have a clinical psych social worker, uh, not only because it's difficult dealing with chronic illness, but a lot of patients come through with PTSD at the hands of practitioners. So we try to provide you with as many tools to deal with your next steps as much as possible. Ah, 
Yes. So I was told that sometimes my talk goes too long. So he said, do a joke. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you got a zebra rolling in the mud. <laughs> Another zebra rolling in the mud. <gasps> this is a really dirty picture. Two zebras rolling in the mud. <laughs> so so <clears throat> as I told you, I, um, I had a little boy who came to see me. Um, and uh, I really didn't know much about EDS. Uh, I knew about T cells and B cells, but not much about mast cells. And uh, after looking at him and figuring, and his mom's like, yeah, he's been, you know, we've all been diagnosed with, with uh, at the time the terminology was classic, God bless, uh, uh, EDS. Um, I'm like, okay, I need to kind of figure out this EDS thing because I've only had one question many, many moons ago and I passed my boards, so that was it. Um, and so I went to a great resource, this is Dr. Google, and I came across this wonderful article by John Symes, Can EDS Be a Key to Collagen and Mast Cell Disorders? And he basically asked, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's pondering observations of his patients. He's saying, you ever see some of these patients who end up with really strange tears uh, in their ligaments, and they have GI problems, and they may get early cancers and rheumatological issues, and they might have behavioral issues. You think, and some of them really seem to develop this stuff early in life. Sound familiar? Okay. So, he, he, he went, and he said, you know, there's certain groups of people, certain groups of his patients that do that. Here's the thing. He's a veterinarian. But he's seeing this in certain inbred species. Calves. Matter of fact, my brother had an old English bulldog. In the springtime, she ruptured two cruciate ligaments running in the spring. It's crazy. And developed mast cell tumors. So there's something to be said about you know, your, your, the house that you've built uh, when you came into the world now. So, a little more research. I actually saw this paper back in 1977. Uh, Dr. Schneerson made this comment that, you know what, individuals that have connective tissue disorders, especially Marfan-like, it's 1977, um, seem to be more at risk for developing uh, mast cell dysfunction compared to ones that have other forms of connective tissue disorders. And yes, I started bending people. <laughs> and here's the thing, she, this is her elbows. I'm like, okay, that's not right. <laughs> Does she also have vitiligo? No. This, this is a birthmark. Birthmark, yep. But that's another autoimmune disorder, meaning, so again, it's, autoimmune is loss of tolerance, right? You're now becoming intolerant. And whether or not it's something that's outside of you that gets in you or something that's in you in the first place. So, you know, generally speaking, all the effort should be to regain tolerance because avoidance doesn't build that. So, um, my next foray into the world of EDS, this was a paper um, by uh, Marco Castori, who is a geneticist in Italy, and he said, look, there's something more than just joint problems in these individuals, and this is why rheumatologists, uh, for the most part, underserve uh, this community. They have a fun, they look for autoantibodies, and that's great. But you know, find, in my opinion, finding autoantibodies is like finding shell casings on the floor, and the person's already on their way to the hospital. Okay, mast cells are able to do a lot of damage without having antibodies around. Um, but he speculates, okay, so, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, endocrine issues, uh, you have dysautonomia, pelvic floor dysfunction, chronic headache disorders, and he speculates immune dysregulation, but at the time he didn't, he didn't think it, what it was. And so that is a mast cell with all its ripe, plump granules filled with lots of different chemical mediators waiting to get released. So we did a quick study. Um, so this is old. We're now up to 17 different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as, we get, as the genetics gets better. Um, and again, we started bending people. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm like, okay, I have one child that bent her finger all the way up. I'm, like, I'm good, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, and this is a mother and son. 
And interestingly enough, he got sinus infections twice a year. And the only way we got it under control was using certain supplements, saline washes, um, and, he, and then we were able to get him under, under better control as well. And we also told him, stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can see these are the, this is an old study. These are 10 patients. This is what we presented at the college meeting. Um, all Caucasians, so again, we're, we're, we're there are other groups that are just not poorly represented. And, and again, in order to figure out how to help yourself, you have to have the resources on how to figure out how to help yourself. Um, and interestingly enough, no genetic variant was identified for these individuals. So they were confirmed EDS, either through genetics or rheumatology. Um, and, rel and there were uh, uh, two sets of family members in this group. Um, they all complained, 70% of them complained of at least two organ systems involved. So whether it's rhinitis, urticaria, uh, seven out of 10, I believe, were treated for anaphylaxis at some point in time. So that's criteria number one. Did they get better with the medications? Histamine blockers were like a game changer for them. That's criteria number two. The biggest problem was the data. Um, and they all had, interestingly enough, a tryptase that was like, two or three, right? But, and I wasn't gonna challenge them. It's kind of like EP, anybody you know, do EP cardiologists? They put you into a bad rhythm and hope to get you out? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna do that in my office. <laughs> Stories go a long way. Um, but again, but they were all serologically negative. IgE was less than 10. Oh, sorry. So, but if you ask, if you ask the allergists, you know, if you want to figure out how well or how many different ways mast cells can misbehave, just ask an allergist how many different ways someone can develop hives. Medications, stinging insects. As a matter of fact, you can tell somebody who has a mast cell disorder if they have anaphylaxis to a stinging insect and you can't find IgE to honeybee or wasp or what have you. Certain medications will do it, certain infections will do it. Um, I can't tell you, everybody had, you know, and we're ground zero um, to the measles outbreak. We found individuals that have no protection against measles, uh, no protection against strep, um, selective antibody deficiency, common variable immune deficiency. It's, it's just like the mast cells don't have enough sensors to figure out what's dangerous and what's not. It's kind of like having just one TSA agent at JFK and like 50 planes just came in. And that can, that can lead to tissue damage. And if you have tissue damage, guess what the mast cells are going to do? They're going to jump into the fray and they're going to talk to the nerve fibers and they're both going to say there's a lot of damage going on and you need to do something. So I, I want to talk a little bit about immunodeficiency because, uh, the, you know, most of you have had a very long road just getting the diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and comorbid disorders that are associated with it. The average time to diagnosis of somebody who has a primary immune deficiency could be up to seven to 10 years after the onset of symptoms. And I just had a gentleman, I, this happens once a year. I had another gentleman who was referred to me for medication to help his asthma, one of the biologics for eosinophilic asthma. But the pulmonologist didn't send any data. And so I got the data, and it didn't turn out he didn't have eosinophilic asthma, he had common variable immunodeficiency that was completely missed for 20 years. And he's already, he's already remodeled his lungs. So these are really simple questions. You know, if you end up with sinus infections, if you needed intravenous antibiotics separate from Lyme, <laughs> uh, you've had deep-seated infections like, you know, post-surgery, and needed IV antibiotics, if there's a family history of immunodeficiency, you don't have enough sensors or you don't have enough cells to do the right job. And the common analogy I use is if your house is on fire and the police show up, are you gonna be upset about that? No, but can they put the fire out effectively? No. So it's the same thing about the mast cells. They're gonna show up because you know they, they detect danger. They're gonna start kicking out chemicals to the best of their ability, depending on what receptors were or were not engaged. And so what we have found in, in, in our office is individuals, again, don't have enough T cells running around, don't have enough of the right antibodies to recognize strep or homophilus influenza 
or uh, pertussis, or they have uh, d deficiencies in complement. And actually, the biggest signal that we've detected, which is a controversial subject in allergy immunology, we've identified 94 people out of the 600 that have mantle spinal lectin deficiency. And most people would be like, oh, what's mantle spinal lectin deficiency? But man, mannose binding lectin um, was originally identified in the 1960s in a baby that was completely intolerant to mama's milk. And mom didn't have to remove milk. She had to remove grains. Mannin is recognized in some molds, some bacteria. <clears throat> and, without, and they estimate anywhere from 10 to 30% of the Caucasian population lack this protein. So again... What makes you susceptible to your mast cells misbehaving might be you don't have the right sensors. Uh, some, so again, just emphasizing what we've identified, these are some of the posters that we've presented uh, either at the American Academy of Asthma Allergy Immunology or the American uh, College of Asthma Allergy Immunology. Um, so we really kind of look to see whether or not your mast cells are compensating for a deficiency that has yet to be identified. Um, is there another comorbid disorder? Uh, some intrinsic issue with your nerves or the fact that your nerves have come under attack. We've identified plenty of patients that have chronic immune demyelinating polyneuropathy. That's that lovely EMG test. Uh, small fiber neuropathy, I have to tell you, is rather controversial uh, from what I tell from the neurology community, but I'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> um, it, it really is more than just allergies. Um, and I think if anything, I would really thoroughly encourage um, that you write out your history because if you just do review symptoms, you guys are going to check multiple symptoms in each organ system. You need to kind of organize your thoughts and kind of tackle, and I usually tell people when they come to my practice, please pick three things because let's, let's just tackle these three now and then let's see what else we can find, okay? But we have to review what has been done because, interestingly enough, everybody has had a lot of these tests already, um, and it just hasn't been um, uh, fully vetted out. And so, in a lot of, in, in in many ways, you can be your own house and trying to identify what might be causing your mast cells to misbehave. Um, and this is just uh, talking about what. <laughs> interestingly enough, um, most. Uh, non-psychiatrists are the biggest dispensers of psychiatric medications. So if they have eight minutes, that's what's going to happen. And then if you don't get any better because your body's stressed and taking a medication that says you're not stressed, even though your body's stressed, it ain't going to work. Um, there's lack of information, which you are addressing here among the patients. There is lack of information among general practitioners. I really view the general practitioner as the person who should be coordinating the other specialists that are involved in your care. And then, again, I can't tell you how many allergists have said to me, the trip taste is normal. I'm like, <laughs> um, did you check it? So to give you an example, I'm, I'm finishing up a case report right now. A woman, 74 years old, ended up with scomboid poisoning and her husband, right? Husband got better. She first developed dermatographism for the first time, and then she had asthma, and then she had anaphylaxis. So the poison, right, was the insult. And it just opened up Pandora's box. And it's, it's taken three years for us to kind of close it as much as possible. So this is just a really quick case report. So this is a woman who came to me uh, in 2012. She's a 55-year-old Caucasian woman who's had chronic hives, and I'm allergist number four or five. And she's like, the antihistamines aren't helping. And by the way, she's having you know neurocardiosyncope. She's having mood disorders, GI distress. Um, and, um, and, and unfortunately, she has a doctor for each one of those who doesn't talk to each other. So I decided to kind of do some lab work and a little bit differently. So nobody actually did allergy testing on her because they felt that the IgE was too low. But you can see she has a lot of IgE to decimates, mold, grass. So she's kind of like a sharpshooter immune system. Uh, you can see that there is ongoing tissue inflammation because complement is being called for. But if you just look at the CBC with ZIF, you think nothing's wrong with this person.
Then we did some more testing. She made an antibody against her IgE. So she has autoimmune chronic urticaria. She, <laughs> um, so she has a product positive chronic urticaria test. She's hypogam. And when I looked at it, you know, so these two standard deviations below the mean. And when I got my EMR, I'm like, why are you getting antibiotics three times a year? So she was getting it from the pulmonologist, she was getting it from her ENT, I think her gynecologist threw it in one time. <laughs> and it turns out her urticaria came under control once she went on to IVIG. So her mast cells were saying something's wrong and you need to figure out what's going on. So, so yes, does she have mast cell disorder? Yes, she has the symptoms, two organ systems, IBS, urticaria, neuropsych issues. Um, her tryptase was 9.3. She was lost to follow-up. Otherwise, I would have done a gene-by-gene -gene test to make sure that's not a duplication or a triplication of the alpha tryptase gene. Um, and she, she, was, she, she dropped the F-bomb a few times. Um, uh, she's like, my life is heck. <laughs> But once she got on that regimen, she was much, much better. Um, so we first tried uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Um, so there are at least two different antibiotics we like to use for individuals that have hypogam issues. Um, so you can either use azithromycin or doxycycline. Um, we also put her on colostrum, which is basically IgG. Uh, that you can take orally, uh, probiotics that was tailored to her, and we maintained her on a histamine blocker. She did better on first generation. Um, they work better as antihistamines, but they have a tendency to be sedating. Um, and then when she broke through again, we said, okay, we tried, and she went on to IVIG, and that really was the game changer for her. So classic roadblock to di diagnosing mast cell activation syndrome. Um, unfortunately, we have a very siloed healthcare system. Um, and so this was the little boy I was telling you about, you know, uh, and nowadays, lucky that this child's mother wasn't hauled off for medical child abuse, uh, for going to different doctors. Um, and, and, and literally, so immune mediated disorders, pick an organ system, you have immune cells, mast cells are in everywhere. Um, if you don't know the right tests, that's going to be problematic. You have to tell the lab, keep it cold on pain of your firstborn, no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, definitely go back and look at anything that's been biopsied to see whether or not mast cells, and here's the thing, I, I, I hate when they say normal mast cells. I'm like, what does that mean? If they are spindled shape, if they are clustered, that's a problem. Um, and then medications wise, if you're breaking through H1 and H2, you're only going after one out of a lot of chemicals that these mast cells can kick out, right? And so that's why if there's breakthrough symptoms, I think something is being missed. So I'm going to end on this, um, this comment by Polly Matzinger, who has a wonderful story. Uh, she was uh, a cocktail waitress, I believe. In, um, in, in Southern California near one of the research labs. And so uh, when the scientists used to come in, they would ask, they would start talking science-y stuff. She actually listened and asked a really good question, and they said, you should go to graduate school. I had the pleasure of meeting her at the Rockefeller where she rode up in, on her motorcycle. She's a really cool person. Um, she was banned from the Journal of Experimental Medicine because she put her dog as the first author. <laughs> But she now heads one of the major uh, institutes at National Institutes of Health. And she basically said, and she also was the major advocate of the danger theory on how we can tell, it's not just about self and not self, it's about whether or not your body is stressed, because that's going to raise the alarm. And the more your body is stressed, the, more, the less tolerant you're going to be about anything that you might have had, you breathed in before, you had eaten before, had applied to your skin. And she says, I now believe that the ultimate power lies within the tissues. When healthy tissues induce tolerance, when distressed, uh, the tissue stimulates immunity. Continuing down this path, they may also determine the effective class of response. Um, and so really, avoidance, but also reintroduction 
slowly but surely. That little boy, um, it's amazing. He's now up to, and this is, you know that this is a mast cell kid. Mom says, yeah, we're up to 92 foods now. <laughs> um, real combined effort. Um, but we, we have to keep his lungs under control, his skin under control, his gut under control, because that's about, in an adult, that's about 75 square, to, square feet of territory that needs to be guarded at all times. <laughs>